just gave me goosebumps. That was awesome. Absolutely wonderful. We are living up to our name of being a bridge. An old song in a new setting. Old voices, new voices. But all listening to God's voice. And that's what really matters. Our scripture today reading from the book of John. If you happen to bring your Bible, I invite you to open it up. John chapter 8, fourth book of the New Testament. Starting at verse 2, in a story that's probably very familiar to you. Early in the morning, Jesus came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. During the sermon, you're going to see the steps on which he sat and taught. The, scripture, or the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They said this to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. And again, Jesus spoke to them, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is the good news. Thanks be to Jesus Christ. I had a, a hard time discerning what to preach during the season of Lent. There was no one big metaphor that jumped out at me. So I decided to follow my heart. As I studied the, the lectionary text, I thought, okay, I hear what God's saying to me, but I'm not specifically following the lection. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about what Jesus really meant. And as you hear that, what Jesus really meant, the first thing that popped in my head what, was, what did he mean by the parables and the stories that he told? And often, the disciples would have to ask him, you know, we heard what you said, but what did you mean by that? But that's not where we're going today. Today, we're, we're going more to the point of what his life on earth meant for humankind. To pay attention only to his teaching or only to point out all the miracles that he performed, I think we would be missing the main point. You and I can only imagine living up to his pure, pureness, purity, and holiness. We may wish for it, we may strive for it, we can aspire to it, but given our human nature, our striving is going to end up in frustration. It's just going to be simply an exercise in frustration. No matter how hard we try, we would not be able to make ourselves perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, even though he said we should wish for that, we should try. We could try as hard as we want, but our imperfection will ever be before us because we stumble, we fall into temptation, we bumble around in the darkness the darkness of our own desires and wanting whatever we think will make us happy. How many times have you, you been kind of bored and you thought, you know, I want to do something fun. What's going to make me happy? And you end up going to the mall looking to buy a piece of happiness. 
we might buy something, yeah, but soon enough that new thing isn't new anymore. And we're looking for something else. Or we could eat something and think, oh, that tasted so good. And before you know it, we're hungry again. We also know that following all the right rules will only get us just so far. The Pharisees, they were really big on rules. They used them to their advantage and as a weapon against people, like that woman that was caught in the act of adultery. I've often wondered, what about the man? What about the guy? It takes two to tango, but, you know, that's a whole different sermon. As Jesus pondered, writing in the dust, don't you wonder what he was writing? Wouldn't you love to have seen that? The Pharisees badgered him for a ruling on their question. I suspect that they'd probably been around, listening curiously, one of those many times when he would say, you've heard it said or you've seen it written, and he would go on, but I say to you, as he gives his take on one of those 613 rules in the law of Moses. You know how I know that? Our tour guide in Israel pointed out that in every pomegranate, that hasn't been genetically modified. There are 613 seeds. It's hard to remember that, okay? So 613 rules. Jesus could, he had a way of cutting to the heart of the matter when he said, but I say to you. And he would always kick it up a notch. Getting, just digging, yeah. Right where we live, he had a way. The Pharisees pressed him on the case of that woman standing in shame before them. And Jesus finally gives permission for the fulfillment of the usual punishment, but with the caveat that only the one who has never himself sinned may first throw the first stone. In other words, think about your own life. And when you truly what you truly deserve. If you're honest in your heart of hearts, think about yourself. If you are innocent and guilt-free, go ahead. But if not, you better just walk away. And they did. They all walked away. Jesus calls us to walk away from casting judgment especially if the judgment that we make is self-serving or preserving our own imagined status of better than. Well, I'm okay because I'm better that person or I'm better than him or I'm prettier than her or got more money than them. Yeah, walk away. Jesus calls us to walk away from behaviors that build walls between people, partitioning the world in such a way to preserve our niche, our little comfort zone, saving us from any kind of alteration, from any shift in power or change from what we consider to be normal. Jesus calls us to walk away from division and to walk into the light of his grace and truth, into a world where God's kingdom life is the norm. That Jesus was here on earth at all, that's what really matters, that God sent his son to us. He came to us in human form to show us what God really wants for us, for us to be made whole by God's grace and mercy, no longer fearful or striving to make ourselves good enough, but saved by grace. That's what Jesus means to us. To have faith in Jesus' power to save us, faith in his mercy, faith in Jesus' love for the world, that's what matters. That's what matters now. We cannot will ourselves to heaven. We cannot practice such excellent as to ever work our own way into Christian perfection. Yes, we are called to do good. Do all the good you can. It says right there on the board. Wesley even said that. At least that's attributed to him. We know we're supposed to, as good good Christians, we're supposed to do good things. We're supposed to be kind and generous and all of that. But 
No matter how much good we do, we cannot earn credit or points or we can't earn our way to heaven. It's not by our works, but by our faith. Our faith should be answered with works, but we got to have the faith first. Each of us is essentially bankrupt, except for the love of Christ. Each of us is saved by the love of Christ. Nothing more and nothing less. That's what Jesus meant. And that's what Jesus means for us now. When we seek closeness with God in Christ, we can go on a, a Christian pilgrimage. We're going to call it a Lenten pilgrimage. Sometimes the pilgrimage actually takes you to Jerusalem to see the temple steps where Jesus taught. There they are, right behind me. Those are the steps uncovered by the archaeologist, still there today, where Jesus taught. We could go to Bethlehem, to the Church of the Nativity, built on the spot where tradition tells us that Jesus was born. Now, that gold star in the floor, in the marble there, there's a window. And through that window, what you see underneath is stone. It's the stone floor of the cave where they, tradition holds, he was born. Now, you and I grew up with nativity sets that had this nice little wooden structure for the, the manger scene. Well, odds are it wasn't, probably wasn't a wooden structure. There are tons and tons of caves around there, and the shepherds and the people kept their animals in those little caves. So this is where tradition holds that Jesus was born, in a cave. Okay. We could go to Gethsemane, where tradition tells us that Jesus prayed and wept tears of blood the night he was arrested. This is a mosaic on the, the back of the chancel area in the church built over the rock where Jesus, you see in the picture, he's sitting on a rock praying. If the camera had been pointed straight down, you would see on the floor a rock, like this big around, kind of black. And the, the altar area, the chancel, is built all around that rock. Tradition holds that was the spot where Jesus prayed that night before he was arrested. If you go outside of that church, you can see the olive trees in the garden where he prayed regularly, connecting with the Heavenly Father. This is the garden at Gethsemane. A little bit from where this camera angle is to the right is it the oldest tree in the garden. They figure it's 1,800 years old. Not quite old enough to be a tree that Jesus would have sat under or prayed near. But because Rome, or not Rome, <laughs> Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was destroyed shortly after Jesus' life, like around 70 AD. Um, to start a big fire, they needed fuel. They cut down the olive trees and they carried them across the Kidron Valley. Well, when they cut down all of those olive trees, they sprouted new growth. So these trees are likely the grandchildren of the very trees that Jesus prayed under. Life goes on. If we keep on our, our tour, we can walk the Via Della Rosa, following the path where Jesus was forced to carry his cross. And along the way, you can see the church that was built to remember that crown of thorns that they pressed into his scalp. This is the ceiling of that church. It's gold. See the crown of thorns with the lights? That's a beautiful church. We can even go from there to touch the stone that tradition says is where they lay Jesus' dead body. Or you can see a tomb like the one where Jesus was laid to rest and where the stone was rolled away that Easter morning. Now this is not in Jerusalem. 
but it is like the ones where his body would have been laid. You can see the guardrail. This is just along the highway. I said, Tom, quick, take a picture. See the round stone? That's what they did. The tombs were used over and over by families. So they would roll the stone once the body was laid in there and with all the herbs and spices and everything they did to anoint the body, they would roll the stone and cover it up. Very, very heavy, as you can imagine. Not easy to roll away, but possible. It, I grew up thinking it was a round rock, you know, that kind of a stone. Well, no, this is the kind of stone they put in front of the tomb doors. Because after the body's laid there for a year, and we all know what happens over time, about a year later they'd go back and they would collect the bones of their loved one and they would put that, the bones in an ossuary box, which is like about that long, that wide, made of stone. And on that box they would engrave who it was and all of that. And it would be kept in another part of the tomb. But where they laid the body out was used over and over and over again by the family. So you can see what it would have looked like. I'm sure Mary couldn't imagine herself rolling that stone away by herself. We can go all these places and follow the path of tradition where buildings cover two millennium of history, built up and around and over, making it virtually impossible to perfectly recreate in our minds what happened to Jesus. But all of that can mean absolutely nothing without faith. It can be simply a historical tour of cultural places where wars are fought, were fought, are still today. You're finding great division and control of access. This is a sign when you're coming up and you want to go to the Temple Mount, the, to the, where the temple was in Jerusalem. You have to go through guards, a guard post. And this is a sign that says that no Israeli, I think Jewish citizen, is allowed to enter the Palestinian Authority territory, which is the top of the Temple Mount. The, the Jews can go down and pray at the Wailing Wall. Um, anybody can go through the archaeological parts, on, but to go up on top of the Temple Mount, you have to go past the guards who are wearing machine guns. You have to go through a, a scan, you know, metal detector. You have to have your bags checked in case you're trying to take a bomb or something dangerous in. It's like going into a prison. I thought, how sad is that? It's beautiful, but sad. It's our faith that saves us, not proof laid out in some laboratory. Faith in Jesus' power to lift us up out of the pit of despair or depression, out of guilt or shame. This is where the real power lies. Power and control over land and holy shrines does nothing for our souls. Jesus put no stock in ownership of property or things. God sent his son to do for us what none of us could do for ourselves. He came to show us grace and truth. He came to shine the light of life into our world for us to live as if this matters. That's the next step. That's where we go from here. So what does that look like? Where do we begin? I think the easiest place to always begin is with forgiveness. Forgiving others the way we can want God to forgive us. This frees us for a life that is no longer weighed down by fear or hatred. The burden is lifted from our shoulders, replaced by Jesus' much lighter load of grace and love. The next step is to share that grace and love and live in the light of that love. No longer withholding because we want to punish the other person for what they've done. 
We're not trying to seek control, but we're freed to move on, letting the past be the past. And looking into the future, a future that God has in mind for us. Jesus told that woman, go and sin no more. Go forward, no longer defined by the past. Move ahead into new possibility. He tells all of us, judge not lest you be judged by the same measure. For the measure you give will be the measure that you get. None of us is perfect. So should we try? Should we even bother? I think Jesus would say yes, we should try. We should do the best we can. Always to choose rightly. We know that we have free will. We experience it in our lives. We can choose one path or another. With the free will we are given, we need to choose wisely and still live humbly. Knowing that the worst of us is only a fraction away from the very best of us. Did you hear about the Pope's admission this week? I love this. He confessed to having stolen a rosary from a dead priest right out of the man's casket. It was his confessor asking mercy as he did so. And Pope Francis wears that rosary to this day as a reminder of his own need for mercy. All of us are in need of mercy. Being reminded of this helps us to stay humble. As we journey through the season of Lent these next six weeks leading up to Easter, be mindful of your own need for mercy. As you confess whatever weighs you down, I would encourage you to let it go. Lay it at the foot of the cross and leave it there. Forgive what needs forgiving, whether it be yourself or someone else. Love the unlovable, even if it's a part of yourself. Show mercy and live humbly, taking from Jesus the power of redemption, the chance at new life in Jesus Christ. We are on a spiritual journey. As we follow Jesus, we find that there is a healing of soul for all who ask, eternal life for all who believe, and hope for new life for everybody who has faith. Not just in themselves, as today's self-help literature teaches, but faith in Jesus, who gives us the strength that is beyond our own capacity. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit that we are given new life. Ask for God's imagination. Ask God to give you a vision of what's next, Lord. What do I have in mind? What do you want me to do next? On your tables, there's little cream-colored sheets of paper. I would invite you, there's four different questions on them. Let me grab them. Thoughts for you to ponder, and if you can't decide today what you'd like to have it say on these, take them home, but try to remember to bring it back, because I'd like you to put them up on the board. Question one, what might your mission look like if you lived out your passion for Christ? That means you've got to talk to God about that one. What are you giving up or taking up for the 40 days of Lent? I'm always curious. Promise me you're not giving up lima beans because you hate lima beans. You never eat them anyways. Do something meaningful. Something meaningful. For us to be a missional church, because every church that has mission has vitality, what mission or ministry would excite you? What idea, what need do you see in this community, in this area, that you see First Churches being able to meet? What would excite you? And the last one, in the 40 days of Lent, what habit would you like to establish? If you do something long enough, it becomes a habit. What would you like to do that would become a habit? And share them, there's some texts over there on the table by the coffee pots. When we share together, we become community. When we know each other, we can 
develop a level of comfort and trust. That's what church is at its very best. So I would also ask you to ask God for God's vision of who we are being called to be as a church. Because together we're on a Lenten journey. And we hope to be led to new life in Christ, restored and made whole for God's purposes. May God bless you this Lenten tide. Amen. Now, a couple people did purple prayer cards. If anyone else has one, you can bring it on up. We're going to pray. This first person simply prays for family. It's hard to be family sometimes because family is made up of people. 